Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Last night I took my wife over to the Florida Hospital on a property right across the street from the old conference office on I-4. I have a 55 foot boom lift, and I told her, You want to see fireworks? Mm -hmm. She said, I said, Oh, come on out, and I'll sh we can watch the ones that down in Lake Yolo. Yeah. So I took her up in this lift, 55, 60 feet in the air. Oh, my. <laughs> and at 60 feet in the air, you're able to see fireworks from Lake Yolo all the way to the Sanford fireworks. Wow. Okay. So wherever you looked, 360 degrees. There was fireworks going on, not to mention private people letting them things off. Um, so that was quite impressive. Right. I got to do that about eight years ago. We were trimming trees at the same place on 4th of July because nobody's in the parking lot then. Uh, and I knew that she would enjoy it. But she did. <laughs> the last time she got up in a lift that high, she actually got down on her knees and she was holding the bottom of the uh, the bucket because it scared her so bad. Tony, you can't do that now. But she, she handled it well. Well, it's, it's nice to be here. Willie, thank you for allowing us to be part of your baptism. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to look at this board. And I will read it to you. Those guys in the front, they can see they can read themselves. Okay? But the first text we want to look at is Philippians 2.3. So let's open our Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is how you have the mind of Christ that Paul talks about in verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do we do that? By not having anything done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, what does that word lowliness of mind mean? Humble, Humble right? It means having a submissive spirit. That I submit to Ray, that Ray submits to Lester, that Lester submits to his wife. Is that right? No, that's right. That's right. That's right. But it's through that spirit of submission with each other that we're able to get along and continue in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you a question. Were we not promised the gift of the Holy Spirit? Yes. And that on the day we believed and that we accepted Christ as our Savior, did He not promise to give us His Holy Spirit? Yes. Amen. So, why is it then that within the church, the Spirit is so powerless? We don't have enough faith. Men are powerless. Okay, so disbelief, men are powerless, we don't have enough faith. I'm going to tell you that's okay, that's good, but it's because of this text. And that is we do not submit to one another. Do you understand? So within the church, the reason why the Spirit doesn't work as powerfully as He would like to is because we do things through vain conceit. And we have ambition. And we bring those ambitions here into the church. Amen. Okay? And so if you want the Spirit to work powerfully, then you have to learn how to submit to your brothers and your sisters. Now I'm going to tell you this. Sub submission is, is not like 
the easiest thing for me. It's not easy at all, actually. <laughs> so listen, here's a question for you. Does submission come naturally? No. No. To some people it does, but it's a surface submission. How many of you have raised kids? Raise your hand. Okay, now how many of you have raised a strong-willed child? Raise your hand. How many of you have raised a submissive child? Raise your hand. How many of you had both? Two kids and both of them, okay? Now, the strong-willed child, I had both of them as well. The strong-willed child, I always knew what I could expect from him. Because he was strong-willed, he was right out there. Uh, you gave him, if you made his choice and you gave him the consequences, he would think through and say, and think to himself, are the consequences worse than me wanting to really do this? And he would do it, and then he would take the consequences. Now, the, uh, the child that was submissive, that's the one you had to watch out for. Because they smiled to your face. They did what you told them as long as you were there, but you had no idea <laughs> what happened as soon as your back was turned. Okay? So I would take the strong-willed child over the one that, you know, you just, you just don't know. But submission does not come easily because we have fallen natures. And so within the church structure, uh, Paul likens us to a body. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That each one of us is a different part of that body. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are noses, some of us are toes. But if you're part of this body and you don't come, something in that body is missing. This is why church attendance is so important. You may say, well, I just don't get a lot out of church. I get more when I'm by myself. Or, hey, man, they got the real preachers on 3 a.m. I can watch them on Saturday. That is selfish. You understand that? When it comes to the functioning of the church and the body, that is a selfish outlook. We need you. And believe it or not, you need us. And it's together that we're able to come and show a complete picture of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Isn't that what the church is for? Yeah. Now, why is it important for us to come together? Well, I'm the pastor, and if I got the treasure up here, we would tell you, well, we need you because we need to pay our bills. So, we need support. But is that the only reason why? No. Some people feel that way. That that's why you only want us here because you want our chance to No. If you're not here, then there is your, each one of us has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that right? And so, Pat, your personal experience with God, how he's worked in your life, all the things throughout all the years that he's done for you, that you know, that there's no other explanation except God did this. The faith that you have, right? The faith that you have. If you're not here to share that with us, then I am lacking something. Yours may be the story that I need to hear to get me through the rough patch that I'm going through. And if you're not here, who's going to share that with me? And so you're not here, then I leave. Because there was nobody here to help me through that rough patch. You see, if one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. If one member of the body has joy and is celebrating, then we all have joy and we all celebrate. We are tied together. Whether you like it or not, if you're part of this church family, you are tied together with the person sitting next to you, in front of you, behind you. That's what a family is about. Gary? Well, I, we've talked about this. I believe that uh, our church is like a, a school. And yes. We, we Pray individually in our homes. We have worship daily in our homes. We come to church and we practice these things that we've been taught by the Holy Spirit. And we help each other to understand. And then we take it from here out to the world. Amen. Very well said. Let's look at Colossians 3.3. 3. No, I'm sorry, 3.13. Colossians 3.13.
Let's actually start with 12, because that's a beautiful verse as well. <coughs> Colossians 3.12. Ray, can you read 12 for me? Yeah. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Beautiful. New King James says, therefore, as the elect of God. Who are you? This is probably the easiest thing that we forget in our day-to-day -day lives. And this is another <coughs> important reason why you should come to church, is to help you remember who you are. You're not just another person in this world. You are the very elect of God. You're a royal priesthood. All right? A child of the king. Do you realize that Peter tells you that you have an inheritance that is incorruptible? Do you know what that word means, incorruptible? It means that nothing takes it away. How many of you guys have money in the stock market? How many of you guys lost money in the stock market? Oh, yeah. Okay? All right? How many of you guys have a home that uh, about 10 years ago just kept increasing in value every year? Now, how many of you guys have that same home that ain't even anywhere close to that thing? Okay? That's what this world offers you. Today you can be rich, and tomorrow you can be poor. Is that right? But in Jesus Christ, you have an inheritance that is incorruptible. It means it will never lose value. It never rusts. It never goes away. And if you're faithful to God, it will never be given to anybody else. This is another reason why it's important that you come to church. Because God wants to meet you here. You have an inheritance that is incorruptible, and God wants you to know it, experience it, touch it, take it off the test drive. Doesn't the Bible say, taste and see that the Lord is good? Amen. What is He good for? Okay, is that all you can come up with? What is the Lord good for? The Lord is good for providing my needs. The Lord is good for helping me when I've done something really stupid. The Lord is good for forgiving me when I can't forgive myself. The Lord is good for putting me in a house full of people who are in the same Lord I am. Okay? And there ain't nobody here better than me. And there ain't nobody here worse than me. That together, we all need a Savior. Is that right? Yes. The Lord is good because He has given us a planet that even though it has been marred by sin, you realize that there was a worldwide flood that wiped everything out, and the beauty that you see in nature is a second part after that flood? If it's this beautiful now, what was it like before the flood? If it was that beautiful then, what's it going to be like when He recreates it again without the taint of sin? An inheritance that is incorruptible. What is God good for? Oh, there are so many things I can't list them. God gives you breath when you wake up in the morning, but God also gives you suffering and sorrow that you can endure so that you can learn to be long-suffering. God loves you so much that He's not the paternal grandfather that just gives you candy and everything you want, but God loves you enough to allow pain to come into your life because you are sinful. And you need a loving Savior. Right? That's one of the things that as I continue to grow and mature that I love most about God. That God gives me the things that I don't like because in the end it's the best thing for me. And that God loves me so much He will give me what is best more than what I want. That's the difference between a spoiled child and a child that's able to grow up and be a productive part of society. Right? And God wants you to be a productive part of His kingdom, an inheritance that is incorrupt. Okay? We're not my class. Okay, so, <coughs> Colossians 3.12, as Ray read, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, so what are you? You're the elect of God. How does God see you? Holy and beloved. Now, I like the beloved part, but that holy part scares me. Do you know why? 
Because it calls me to accountability. Because Peter again tells me, be ye holy. Why? Because God is holy. And I say, how can I be holy when I am born with a sinful nature? Any ideas on that one? Submit. Say it out, right? Death. Death to what? That's self. There you go. You in your fallen nature can never be holy. You have to die. This is why over and over in the New Testament, Paul says, I die what? Daily. Daily. And if we are dead to sin, okay, then we're made alive again in Christ. This is another reason why the Spirit doesn't work as powerfully as He would like to. And that is because we do not, you know, we are not dead to sin. Right? I'm right there. Okay? Listen. 1 Timothy 1, 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation. What is that word? Okay, somebody find 1 Timothy, chapter 1. I think it's exceptional. Is it acceptation? Yeah. So that's a whole word. Acceptance. There you go. That's a whole word. King James. This King James. What is it? 1 1? It's 1 uh, Timothy 1, verse 15. So this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Who wrote that? Paul. Paul. And what does he say? How does he view himself? Chief. Why do you think Paul said he was the chief of sinners? Do you think Paul was going to the bars after he preached and uh, evangelized? He wasn't looking at people. He was looking at Jesus. Okay. Paul also remembered what his past was. And what was Paul's past when he was Saul? He persecuted Christians, right? <laughs> Paul, you can understand why he said he was the chief of sin. He fought against Jesus Christ himself. And if he could, he could have put him to death when he was Saul. But yet, God loved him so much that God gave him a Damascus experience. Okay? So... That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Is there anybody here that meets that qualification? Amen. Raise your hand. Okay. So Christ came into the world to save you and to save me because I am a sinner outside of Christ. And Paul said, of whom I am chief, how be it for this cause I obtained what? Mercy. Mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. What's another word for long suffering? Patience. patience. But it's so much deeper than just patience. Long suffering. Something that's going to last a long time. Patience. So listen. How patient should we be with each other here in this church? We need to be long suffering. Stop using the word patience because I can be patient for about three minutes. And if our conversation can last two and a half, I'm good. Okay? If I can fix your problem in under three, no problem. You'll say, I'm a patient guy. But take me to 301 and uh, the long suffering may not kick in because I can't do that myself. I need to let this old man die, and I need to be recreated. I need a new nature. Who gives me the new nature? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of Christ. The mind of Christ. It's brand new. The old things have passed. Now listen, I love that the old things have passed, but have they really passed? Did I get rid of that old nature? No. Now listen, it is a constant battle. The Spirit of Prophecy, she talks about people get tired of fighting the battle. 
God tells you, don't grow weary in well-doing. Listen, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you have to have obedience. To give it, you have to. But the obedience doesn't come from you. It comes from the Spirit living inside of you. And the Spirit gives you obedience. But your old nature will try to take control and bring you back into disobedience. This is why it is a daily, daily fight that you have to lay down yourself, and take up your cross daily, and follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Galatians 2.20? What does that say? Look at Galatians 2.20. Underline that verse and make that the verse you live by. Okay? So how be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all patience and longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Why did Paul suffer everything he suffered? So that you and I would have an example that we can look back on and say... If Christ brought him through his trials, his temptations, then Christ can bring us through our trials and temptations. Now, was Paul tempted? Yes. Did Paul suffer for the name of Christ? Yes. He writes down what he went through. Okay? How many times he was beaten? He was shipwrecked. How long he spent out in the deep? Right? But do you realize Paul also said that these light and momentary trials, light and momentary afflictions. Now, I don't have afflictions anywhere near what Paul had, and I don't see them as light nor momentary. I do see them as afflictions, though. But God is showing me that this is what's needed for me to learn long-suffering, to learn to have the mind of Christ. And the question is, brothers and sisters, is what is it that you want? What do you want from God? What do you want from Christ? What do you want out of your walk with Christ? Do you want God to meet every need and make your road smooth, roses on each side, and no thorns? What do you want from God? Say, say that loud, right? I want to be more like Him. What did you say? For eternal salvation, you have to have what He said. And that is to be more like God. <laughs> the, 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 the Christian life and the Christian walk is not easy. This is why that road is narrow and the gate is small. And the road to destruction is broad and long. Which is an easier road, the broad wide one or the narrow one? Okay? So, this is the irony of the Christian faith. You can't purchase it, but it'll cost you everything you have. Right? Yeah. You can't earn it, and you can't buy it, but it takes everything you've got. Why? Because God does not want half-hearted disciples. He doesn't want 50% of you. He doesn't even want 90% of you. What does God want? He wants all of you. All of you. Seek God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. That's what God expects and requires. How do we do that? You can only do it by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How do you know that God is real? I've asked you this question. I've had you put it down on paper. No, I asked you how do you know God loves you. But how do you know that God is real? Because you read it in a book? Everywhere we look should show. Okay, because you can see it. Yeah. Gary, what you say? Everywhere we look, we should see, see the works of God. Okay, Fran, what did you say?